Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk about programming in the 50s and presenting several snapshots of five pictures. The, the takeaway message about programming in the 50s is actually that language is a central world. So we have natural language, artificial language, and programming language. Um, Several, uh, in, in the 1950s, ling linguists had already for several decades been studying natural language. And logicians had already been studying artificial language. But what was new in the 50s was that by the end of that decade, people started to use the words programming language. And not, not before. And we have linguists influencing applied mathematicians, or if you like, programmers. The work of logicians influencing these people. The work of logicians influencing the linguists, and vice versa. So, the, so it was a decade of cross-fertilization between these three domains. Examples, Gagilel and Chomsky uh, were, or became, uh, famous linguists. The work of Emil Post and Alan Turing in, uh, had a great impact on some programmers who were influential in the history of the ACM. And these people were also influenced by the work of Chomsky and Wagner. So that's the takeaway message, cross-fertilization between these domains. Now let's zoom in and look at 1954. People have, uh, researchers have already for many years talked about machine language and they have for some years distinguished between the machine language and pseudocode. But in 54 in a conference, John Carr consistently described pseudocode as a language. And I dare say that he was rather exceptional in that, in that matter. Today we, we talk about programming language. But this was a, a new way of looking at programming. And he talked about closing the gap between the external language of the machine and the internal language. And he became good friends with his close colleague, Saul Gore, who at that same conference talked about universal machine independent pseudocodes. And by the end of the 50s, everybody was talking about universal machine independent programming language. Now, again, they were, Carr and Gore were influenced by the linguists. They were working on machine translation, Us using this new tool for computer to translate Russian into English. They were heavily financed by the American Department of Defense. And there's, it's not a coincidence that these two uh, drawings look alike. In fact, if we talk a little bit more about for what the professional linguists were doing, based on Warren Weaver's 1949 um, manuscript called uh, the Translation, researchers were trying to find an as yet undiscovered universal language, so that these natural languages could be translated to this language and then to the target language. And the technology used here is was very similar to the technology used by programmers who were, by the end of the decade, translating these languages, Fortran and Alpo, for example, to a machine-independent language and translating that to different machine languages. For example, the push-down store, also known as a stack, was used in both domains. They were actually doing the same things. Now, the language metaphor of 1950 for is one way to look at programming. Carr, Gorn, and some other uh, researchers also, in 1959, started to describe their programming efforts in terms of skins of an onion, where we have an inner machine, the inner skin, corresponding to a physical machine, and we have outer levels and an outer machine, which we would today call a virtual machine, run on the inner machine. This inner machine, in their own words, was the physical embodiment of a universal Turing machine. So this is where Alan Turing's work, the recast version of his work, becomes relevant. If 
if you put the language metaphor and the onion skin metaphor together, then we have a hierarchy of levels. Each level is either a language or a machine. They're, they become interchangeable, these words. They become synonyms. You can look at a programming language as a language, something rather static or operationally as a machine. Likewise, the physical machine or the machine language. And this was, um, by the end of the decade, it was all about hierarchical design of programming languages. Again, Turing influenced the work of Turing in a recast version based on Cleaney's uh, 1952 meta mathematics, in, uh, led to this onion skin metaphor. That's what I mean with this arrow. One final uh, message is that many programmers were reasoning from the physical machine upwards, and some, like uh, Saul Gore, John Carr, these were the ACM actors, but also Esther Dijkstra uh, in the Netherlands, they were looking rather from the programming language downwards. That's a, a, a big difference in the way they approach their programming problems. So, I will now conclude by saying a little bit more about Alan Turing's work, how it influenced the work of Carr and Gore in the late 50s. So, Carr was president of the ACM in the late 50s and was also um, a member of the Turing Award Committee in the second half of the 60s. And Gore also was very active in the ACM. So, these were powerful people. They were not only very good researchers, they were building, uh, helping build the ACM and they needed an award and that became the Turing Award in 1966 which they handed out to their close colleague Alan Perlis, the first Turing Award winner. Now they were not only very practical, they were also theoretically inclined. I already mentioned that they read Cleaney's Meta Mathematics, they read Markov's book, they read Rosenblum's book on logic from 1950 and they were trying to link real program, real machines to universal Turing machines. And so in 1955, these are the words of Gordon, in 1955, that's where I see it for the first time, give or take maybe, maybe a year or two, for the first time he really links a, what he calls an ideal general purpose machine to a universal Turing machine. If you look at what he wrote before 1955, um, it's all about loop control machines and, and programming uh, jargon. But the theoretical connection comes here. And the universal true machine, he said, can copy the description of a special purpose machine. I'm just going to let this run in some of the questions you can ask them now. Thank you very much. about the role of Bahilel in that history because Bahilel was told, I don't remember by who, <coughs> the girdle of machine translation. Yeah. Because uh, after after the Georgetown experiment, uh, he he told uh, that uh, in DARPA, it, it, he told that we couldn't uh, have a general valid uh, machine translation yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I had the impression from your, your uh, unusual, unusual but very interesting presentation uh, that Barakila uh, was uh, someone who, uh, who believed in machine translation in that year. Tell something more. Yes, so you're, you're right. So uh, Barakila was one of the first skepticists about machine translation. Uh, so. So, you're right, so around 19, maybe the late 50s, but yes. certainly, certainly by the early 60s, he was very skeptical. Uh, but what I'm just trying to say is he was part of the machine translation community of people. Uh -huh. And uh, why, why I put him up there was that he was very much influenced by post correspondence uh, theorem. 
uh, no problem. So what we call undecidability today. So he was influenced by logic. Oh, okay. And his 1961 paper, 62 paper, uh, was an application of post correspondence problem in the context of uh, linguistics, but which was then taken over by the by the programmers as well. So okay. it's just to, that was just to show that there's a lot of cross fertilization, and he was actually were his students who were very theoretically inclined, and they jointly wrote that paper in 61. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, would you care to speculate on where you see programming languages going now? We've, you know, we've very much in the, the context of the, the von Neumann uh, architecture and uh, imperative languages. Would you care to speculate as to where today? Yeah, where things where things may be going in the future. Uh, well, I've been like studying as I tried to be a historian for four years, so I did study computer science, but now you're asking me a question about tomorrow, not about yesterday. <laughs> what, what, I, what, I can say, what I can say is that in the 70s, people like Grace Hopper, so these were very famous uh, programming experts, they were uh, clearly ex expressing their favor for Howard Aiken's distinction between data and instructions, separating those two. Because the common paradigm had become all about common storage, but there was she was explaining for for the sake of protection of what we today call security, you want to separate these two, uh, and that is uh, that is a perhaps uh, a distinction with what uh, the prevailing uh, paradigm was in the in the early fifties. But I'm not. I guess I, I guess I didn't answer your question. <laughs> what about you? Uh, would you think it's fair to say that? You know, get back to Grace Hopper and the distinction between code and data. That the people that computer science has historically favored the, the code side and sort of treated the data side as second-class uh, uh, citizens until recently. We're now we're now people are looking at data, in, you know, in a different way. But you know, yeah. but would you agree that? It, in a way, computer science has pushed the data focus off to the side, or has in the past. I, I think, uh, if I would have to say yes or no, I say it's yes. <laughs> but I would, I would recommend Mark Priestley's book, uh, Science and Automations, where he explains this. Uh, so you're referring to later developments like maybe even object oriented programming, uh, where he says data becomes uh, indeed a uh, first class citizen. Yes, yes. Uh, you, sh you have shown this hierarchy with the uh, arrow up and arrow down. Yes. Does it somehow help to, uh, to distinguish how we should learn the languages? <laughs> so what is better, going from the top to the bottom or from the bottom great, to the top? Great <laughs> so I actually asked Tony Horvitz, um, and so Dexter would have said I'm pretty confident about this, go from the top down. <laughs> he did this already uh, in the late 50s. I'm not saying he did this in the very beginning. But Tony Hoare, by contrast, because they were close colleagues, still had a contrast, he was always teaching his students just one level higher, and then maybe in a month a level higher. He always wanted to teach in that manner. Mm -hmm. So even though they were close colleagues, we share the same research agenda and you see the differences. And uh, my personal opinion, you know, <laughs> I, but my personal opinion is we have different kinds of students, so for the sake of simplicity, we probably always choose one way to teach, but maybe some students would prefer one approach and not another. But yeah, okay. Yes. Could you say something? I mean, to show to the audience the more of the hierarchy. Could you say something about uh, the, the language is obviously influenced by the hardware of the, the machines they have available, and they are nowadays still influenced by. We had to sort of like, you know, let's say this this diversity with like trying to bring complex instructions from the high level languages into the processor and then they weren't used very much so people went to the risk scheme and the small the back. But if you look at sort of this unconventional computing with a lot of uh, around this conference, could you imagine sort of what concepts could be in a language that is influenced by you know, not a, a classical von Neumann machine, but you know, a chemical computer or something like that? <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not the guy to <laughs> look. I'm not 50 years. Look, ask me this in 50 years, I might know something about this. But <laughs> I have to be I'm humble here. I know. I mean, I'll think about this, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe if I had a glass of wine, we can discuss. Return the video off, and then you can speculate. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. This is gonna be on YouTube, so I better be careful what I say. <laughs> Comments by itself, the very first picture. Where you have those three incoming streams, artificial intelligence, and linguistics, and programming. If you go back to the real history, some of these branches actually are much older than the 50s or the top. For example, the linguistic, the natural language one, goes back at least 2,000 plus more years. Take Grant's bots, i.e., about the origin of Grant with Alini series. What about robots? Did you just ask me? Sorry, I didn't hear the question. Um, how far would you want, if you want to give a full history, each of these three branches, how far would you want to trace them back in the history? Um, well, a couple of years ago I said I would never look at the 50s. I mean, the 70s was the earliest I would want to go. Now I'm really interested in the 50s. I certainly want to look at the 30s, I mean, during this paper and uh, into the journal. Um, I guess as I perhaps maybe get older, I will look more into the past. Uh, how far do I want to go? Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, 1850? <laughs> If you take computation series, you should at least go back to Bennett's because he also has a language. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's fair, that's a fair remark. So, but but what I do now is I, I refer to secondary sources for Bellage, but yes. I'm not sure how about the light means, but the idea of artificial language that also goes over to the oh. seventy seventy. Sure. So, there is much more history than you were telling us. Oh yeah, that's a uh, that's good. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.